So the case of repeated roots is wonderful because if you weren't a student of linear algebra, you might miss it altogether that you're missing something and only later realize that, gee, things aren't working. So let's see what happens. Once again, equals zero because I will just tell you that nothing really changes with respect to the particular solution, so let's not dwell on that. Let's dwell on the null space. If there was anything on the right-hand side, you would take, with the exception of the resonant case, which is next time, very interesting, uh, nothing would really change. So I just want to focus on the null space. And null space looks like this, C1, times something plus C2 times something else. And I just want to start here because it's non-negotiable that that's what the null space looks like. Because if you approach this equation or any of the equations that we've discussed so far, whether they have real roots or no roots, in other words, complex roots, and whether complex roots are pure imaginary or mixed, whatever you call it, or whether you are, in this case, if you think through the logic of a treasure hunt, these equations couldn't care less how the roots work out or how actually complicated these coefficients are. So the argument that leads to the null space being two-dimensional is completely unaffected by how the roots might work out from the point of view of your specific approach to the problem. So it's always... That's why it's so helpful to have more than one perspective. Because from the perspective of roots, something's funny here. And if you only have that one perspective, then you might think, well, this is, a, this is an awkward, quirky equation where something different happens. But then you think, yeah, but let me think about it from the treasure hunt point of view. And then you realize, well, no, it can't be different because that approach doesn't care about the coefficients. So we need two equations, two different functions here. Okay, let's go to the equation. And the two roots, both negative three. And so, if you proceed the way you used to, you would write this. Okay? And if you're just studying calculus, you're thinking, okay, that's a little strange. But I'm okay with it because it's actually simpler than what I had before. Because I can simplify this. It's C1 plus C2 e to the minus 3t. But a linear algebra person will say, not, we'll use those very words, not linearly independent. So we're not capturing a two-dimensional subspace. It's not that they're the same. I can easily make them not the same by putting a coefficient in front of one of them. But that won't change the fact that they're not linearly independent. They're linearly dependent. So we're not capturing the null space. You can take this a step further and think, well, suppose I ignore it. I hate linear algebra. I'll just linearly depend on my ass. I'll just ignore it and proceed. Well, what will happen later on? Later on, you'll end up with a system that's not invertible precisely because these guys are not linearly independent. You will end up with this matrix, okay? And then you'll have to solve for C1 and C2, and you will not be able to because this matrix is not invertible. And you'll say, hey, that's not a problem either, so I have infinitely many solutions. So, I like linear algebra. I like it when there is infinitely many solutions. But then you won't be able to satisfy the two initial conditions that are given. And this system must come with two initial conditions. It's a second order system. You will not be able to get the system going, to get the solution going, without two initial conditions. So it'll break down later. If you're not a student of linear algebra, you'll have to wait until it breaks down later. Okay, so what do you do in this case? So linear algebra perspective compels us to find a new linearly independent vector that belongs to this null space. 
And I don't know how someone did it initially. Do I have a method for deriving it if I don't already know what it is? I don't think I do. But I already know what it is and what you do in these situations. You take one of these guys and you multiply it by t. And you try t times e to the minus 3t. t times e to the mi Well, should I just sneak it in there? Yes, I think I might. So if you generally have a second order equation and one of the roots happens to be minus 3, and you just say, you know what, I'll try t to the minus t times e to the minus 3t. You will not get 0. And it won't be a member of the null space. It's only <clears throat> in the special case, I wanted to do this, when the roots are repeated <clears throat> is when something like this all of a sudden enters the null space. And I don't have the intuition for why it's this form. But if you try and plug it in, it's only in this case. I guess if you pick general coefficients a, b, and c and plug this in and that would and stipulate it that it should be in the null space, it'll give you just the right condition for what a, b, c need to be. So knowing what the answer is, I can prove that that's what it needs to be. But I don't know how I would have guessed it in the first place. Pure trial and error. I consider this problem finished at this point. We have the general solution. It has just the right number of linearly independent vectors. So given the initial conditions, the value of the function and the derivative, you will now be able to solve for C1 and C2 and the problem will be completed. So in conclusion, you now know how to solve at least how to find the null space for any ordinary differential equation that's second order or any order because you know what to do for distinct roots, you know what to do for complex roots, you also know what to do for pure imaginary roots even though they're a special case of this. In fact it seems to be a smooth transition, somewhat smooth transition from exponentials to exponentials mixed with sines and cosines to pure sines and cosines. If that isn't a clue to the relationship between exponentials and sines and cosines, I don't know what is. And at the same time, I have to say that even though everyone saw it, it was in everyone's plain sight, nobody could actually put their finger on what the connection really is until Euler did it around 1740, in 1740s as a young man in his 30s.